All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Flow Track Podcast presented by wonderful pistachios at the On Athletics Hub. I am Liv Ekpone, joined here with Ashley Titians in Philadelphia to kick off day two of the Penn Relays presented by Toyota. We also want to welcome OAC's very own Ollie Hoare, George Beamish, the reign, reigning world indoor champion in the 1500 meters. Ollie, George, and Morgan McDonald are part of the Coffee Club podcast. Unfortunately, Morgan is not joining us today because he is competing in China, but you guys are here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank okay. you. Okay, before we dive into everything, we actually have a special gift for all three of you. So we're about to bring it out. Thank you, Jennifer oh, Zahn. Wow. We got you some coffee, some coffee from Austin. So Flow Sports based in Austin. So we have this from Radio Coffee. I believe this is a, a light roast. We heard y'all are big fans of a light roast. So I'll pass <laughs> yes. that over to y'all. These look good, actually. This is from Mozart's. This is a really popular place in Austin. Another light medium roast so there you go and then this one i actually picked this one out it says born in melbourne made in austin so i thought that was kind of funny it says it's a wild roast whatever that means so <laughs> y'all can interpret that however you guys would like wow thank you so much yeah appreciate it yeah you're welcome so you have to let These us know what legit. you think yeah, yeah it's legit yeah you gotta stuff. let us know how they are that one looks good. Yeah, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying trying to see by yeah. where Melbourne this is, uh, this is from, but it doesn't... It's so vague on the back. I'm like, yeah. just as made in Melbourne. Born in Melbourne, made in Austin. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Lovely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so let us know what you think. All right, so Coffee Club Podcast and the Flow Track Podcast are combining together for this one. So, of course, we have to talk track. What has been the buildup been like for you, both of you? Ollie, I want to start with you. Just how are you feeling at this point in the season? Yeah, it's nice to be able to run. Um, in November, I couldn't walk, and uh, it was a bit of a stressful time uh, leading into a big year. But uh, I'm in a really good place right now. I just had the national championships in uh, Adelaide, Australia. I was able to get second place um, there after not racing for 10 months. So that was an interesting experience, uh, just getting the, the rust buster out, as people say. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I really enjoyed uh, the process of getting back into it because it's definitely helped my mental and physical strength leading into a big Olympic year. And mm -hmm. we got some big races planned up leading into Paris. And um, yeah, it was a good place to start particularly. And uh, I'm excited to race here at Penn actually because I think the last time I raced was a relay. And this time um, it'll be a mile with, a, with two teammates. So that's going to be exciting. And also Jordy, Jordy Beamish pacing. That's, a, that's an unusual... In, and really unusual uh, circumstance, and I'm really going to take advantage of it. Yeah, you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about your pacing here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not um, not what I'm known for, but I'm going to give it a go. Now, uh, I'm, I need to pay back the favor. Ollie, Ollie had a go at pacing me to um, have a go at qualifying for Tokyo a few years ago, and came up short, unfortunately. Um, but was very appreciative of Ollie doing that, and uh, I'm going to try to repay the favor mm -hmm. three years later. I know, Ollie, you just expressed how you're feeling mentally and physically going into the later stages of the year, but George, how about for you? How are you feeling now? We're pretty much in May at this point. So how are you feeling? Yeah, we are. I mean, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all coming by quite quick. Uh, yeah, uh, always fun to, to start the season at, at Pin Relays. I had a, had a great time last year and, and, a, and a nice tactical mile um, in, in front of a, a really fun crowd. And yeah, just had a nice... Nice big training block since since World Indoors in, in Scotland and um, yeah excited to ex excited to open up here and um, things have been going pretty well. Awesome. Now you've already officially been named for the steeple chase for New Zealand. This will be your Olympic debut, I believe. It will. Yeah, first one. So tell me about that. Like, what are your thoughts going into that? And obviously, I mean, that's still months away in August, but we are, you know, we're creeping up on that time, you know. So, what are your feelings going into that already being selected? Yeah, it's nice to nice to have it official. Uh, obviously, kind of felt like getting the standard last year was was ticking the that was the main main objective, and um, you know have the luxury in New Zealand just coming from a small federation that um, you know there aren't there aren't a lot of us. So normally taking care of the standard um, you know is enough, and but it's nice to nice to have it official, and yeah, it kind of gave me the. The freedom to to tackle some flat events indoors, which which went pretty well, and um, you know at the end of the day the steeple was you know it's ninety some percent running probably, so um, just trying to get as good at running as possible on the flat first, and ran over my first hurdles less than two weeks ago, so um, 
So you're feeling okay it. going over the hurdles right now? Uh, I mean, I'm glad I'm not racing this week. <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't run a steep wall till June, but no, I'm excited to, to get back over the barriers. And, um, you know, I'm ahead of where I was last year when I was teaching myself how to hurdle for the first time. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, now going to an Olympic steeple will be, will be pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, Ollie, I mean, obviously this is a, bit, a big year, Olympics, but throughout your career, I mean, you've competed uh, at so many different, you know, championships, really. I mean, you've done Worlds, Commonwealth Games, you name it. Like, what is your vision for 2024 where you're at in your career? Obviously, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you've come back from injury and you're feeling mentally strong. Like, what's that vision look like for you in 2024? Yeah, so, like, I think when the team was formed and then we started to, to progress and, and kind of make a name for ourselves in the OAC, it was uh, 2021 Olympic year. Um, and making that team was an extremely um, exciting experience. And then uh, I noticed, particularly for myself, the, the pressures of, of trying to qualify, but also just trying to get your ranking up and, and compete with the best in the world. So once I got to the Olympic final in Tokyo, I was mentally cooked, um, physically probably cooked as well. Uh, so like leading into this 24 Olympic, I do notice that like, particularly for a lot of athletes, the, the trials is the big mental um, and physical battle, but you want to, if you qualify, you want to obviously compete at the, one of the hardest and highest stages in our sport. So trying to prepare for both of those um, situations, it, it's, it's a tough thing. And I think the experience I've had as well as dealing with this injury has given me a good opportunity to kind of reset and progress in the way that I want to. And I'm excited for, uh, for that kind of to come to light and to show throughout the year. And uh, yeah, it's a very exciting year. Um, yeah, competed a lot of uh, championships and a lot of events, but this one will be definitely a, um, a really big one for me personally. Ali, you've been battling through injury that took you out of Worlds last year. You just talked about your strength when it comes to just moving forward mentally. Can you talk about your support system and what that means for you to just be able to ha have people to lean on as you move forward into this Olympic year? Yeah, 100%. I mean, like George and I, um, we, don't, we don't come from very close. We'd, we're, we're very far away. Um, <laughs> Uh, so having that kind of support system in the U.S. is a very, very powerful thing. And uh, obviously the Coffee Club podcast has been a big factor of that. I think George, Morgan and I have very much leaned on to, to that as, as just having fun with it and enjoying it. Uh, being able to use that as, as, a, as an outlet in some ways has been fantastic. And obviously the OAC team um, has been a huge factor for me. It's definitely my second family because I spend more time with them now than I have with my own family. Um, <laughs> so that has been fantastic. Dathan has really cultivated a great team there and um, just being able to have that kind of support, particularly when people dealing with injuries and setbacks, I think uh, the sport is a very cruel thing sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes you, you win some and you lose some, but the great thing about the people that we have around us is they get it, they understand, and they definitely are able to give you that support structure to get you back to where you're supposed to be. And uh, I mean, Morgan has dealt with injuries, George has dealt with injuries, a lot of our other teammates have, um, but having that um, communication that we have, but also just the, the support structure that's in place, I think we don't, you don't see that a lot in a lot of professional individual um, running kind of situations. And I think we're very, very privileged to have that kind of support. So it really helps us perform at our best and also just enjoy what we're doing, which is like the main thing. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the Coffee Club, Club pod is like your, your outlet, you know, because I think that's a perfect segue into my next question, which is I'm sure a lot of these people out here watching right now are fans of the podcast. So for those fans and stuff, Maybe explain a little bit, you know, why and how, you know, it all got started. You know, the origin story. Where do we, where do we begin? <laughs> I mean, we, begin, we begin with, like, so George, Morgan, and myself, uh, Oceana boys, we have a big coffee kind of culture. Um, and we loved, particularly at meets, uh, being able to go to different coffee shops when we travel and just talk talk rubbish. I think that was the one thing that was exciting <laughs> about it. Usually if you see a good coffee shop in a major city or a major meet, you'll run into a lot of Kiwis and a lot of Aussies because that's kind of our pride and joy is finding the best coffee spot. And uh, we used to spend a lot of time just sitting there and talking, particularly when the team was, was, um, was in its infancy. And uh, one of our, um, well, our treatment guy, our chiropractor, Jason Ross, he uh, kind of was there and observed what we were doing and said, hey, you guys should just make this into a podcast. It'd be quite entertaining. The kind of the absolute rubbish that comes out of your mouth. <laughs> we thought it was an interesting outlet. I think uh, George Morgan and I have been able to ex share our experiences as professional runners uh, through a podcast, I think was also a cool thing. And at that time, uh, we, OAC and, and on as a whole was a very new thing. And we, we also took advantage of being able to maybe 
portray and show our team members in, in a certain light, do interviews with them and be, be able to like kind of teach people about the lives of a professional athlete and a professional runner because this sport is extremely hard to follow in some ways and um, there's all these different things going on all at once but I think our podcast is a bit of a chaos but it, it, it kind of encapsulates what it is like to be a professional athlete and um, it definitely has been a fun journey to be able to do. We, we kind of just started it off. I mean, our first episode never aired, episode 100. Uh, <laughs> zero, zero, zero. Never episode aired. Zero. Yeah. yeah. We still have it on the archives, but it's never aired. And that was kind that was of a practice a, run. That was a practice <laughs> run. And then we, from there, we've done, I think we're up to 132, 133 Something. episodes. And we, we try to keep it consistent week by week. We've been able to get amazing guests on. Coffee Club 100 was a huge success for us. I think that took a lot of uh, work. And um, But yeah, I think George... Um, Morgan and I really just enjoyed being able to have that experience of a different light of, of the running because I think being able to connect with people with this sport has given us so much. I mean, George and I and Morgan have come from all the way from Australia and New Zealand to be able to run a college here, to be able to be a professional athlete here, to travel and see amazing people, compete against amazing people. It's given us so much. So to be able to give back some sort of um, content or some sort of, um, I don't know, Whatever, yeah. whatever we call the podcast is, it's just been an, an amazing uh, thing to do. I think similar to the to the founding of of the OAC kind of during during a COVID period. I think the Coffee Club podcast was a little bit of a, a kind of a a COVID kind of phenomenon Co- COVID as well. Baby. COVID yeah, baby. <laughs> a COVID baby. Just because, like on during meets, like we you really couldn't do anything else except sit outside a coffee shop and and kill some time before a race and. You know, there wasn't a, a lot of other stuff going on in the sport. So I kind of think we, we felt like, you know, as newly minted professional athletes, we had like a bit of an obligation to the sport and to the fans to to try and share a bit more of the story. And, um, and when Morgan joined the team, he kind of had the tools to, to make it a reality for us with his... Uh, Expert editing. Expert. And, uh, <laughs> with his YouTube background. Yeah, his YouTube background definitely gave us a little uh, kickstart for sure. Yeah, slight edge that, right there. That made it yeah. um, possible to make it a real thing I, instead of just an idea. Yeah. Hearing that y'all have an unaired like pilot of sorts, yes. I feel like now that you've mentioned this, the fans are going to be like, we need to see it. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you we'll, should drop it. I think we'll have a subscription service one day for just yeah. uh, the off... Uh, or when we retire from the sport, we can <laughs> we can put it in. Yeah. Um, but Either I, episode zero or like the m- few minutes before we click record, yeah. it'll be like a subscription or something. Some something like that. But we have come <laughs> a long way from from doing it on a couch with my dog constantly trying to interrupt us and crappy little ten dollar mics. We now have a little studio and cool mics and a little, big, big little soundboard that Morgan hasn't quite figured out yet. He still <laughs> plays the wrong chime at some points. But, um, it'll, no, get been, it'll get there. It'll get there. Yeah, know? It's, been, no. it's, it's honestly, we're still learning, which is the great thing. We've done yeah, so many episodes, but we're still making mistakes, and that's mm-hmm. the fun thing about it. I love that. Okay, let's take a question from the crowd here. Oh, we have a guy right there in the center. Yes. Can you state your name and ask your question, please? Yeah, Corey from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Okay. Love the pen relays. Uh, I'm a bit of a coffee guy myself. You know, I like the single origin coffees roasted really nicely. I'm curious, what is your favorite coffee, Ollie? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, the flat white is a notorious uh, <laughs> Aussie, uh, Kiwi kind of fought over battle. We don't really know where it originated from, but it was probably Australia. The Kiwis try to claim it, but that's not true. But a flat white is uh, definitely my favorite coffee. Um, George? If you're talking actual coffee, which it sounds like maybe you were, I, I mean, I think I would agree. Like a, a single origin, Central America would be my go-to. And yeah, either a Cortado or a flat white with that. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. If it's later in the day and it's hot, maybe like this afternoon, then I go iced Americano. There same we go. same roast. No iced latte? No, if I, I would have said iced latte if I mean iced latte. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I've seen you have iced lattes in the Is that Morgan then? I'm mixing it up. <laughs> yeah, what's Morgan's favorite? Do you know? Yeah, what's he, it? he loves a. He's drinking a lot of decaf at the moment. He's been decaf. drinking a lot of decaf coffee. But because we, drink, we, we record mostly in the afternoons, and otherwise we'd be up all night. So. Yes, that's true. He'll do some that's decaf fair. stuff, but um, he's been doing some ice lattes. Maybe it's the ice lattes he's been doing. He's been getting me onto that. But um, yeah, no, we, we've been trying to try different coffees and stuff. The one, the pour overs, I'm trying to try that now. But um, cool. the, the coffee shop near where we live in, they always get annoyed when we order a pour over because it takes about 15 <laughs> minutes to do. And it's a very busy coffee shop, so it has a massive line. And then when they see us coming, they kind of They're try like, and, oh. can you please They're order like, anything else? These guys else? are back. Oh, yeah. gosh. So, yeah, yeah. I know uh, Tom Wang, our manager, loves a pour over. So. Yeah. <laughs> we love that. Okay. 
one more question. Yes, Corey. Well, I got a couple questions. Actually. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> George, who's the most particular about their coffee order? On the team or just out of the podcast? Out of the podcast. Uh, I would say Morgan. What's up? Right? Yeah, I was going to say you at some point because you just corrected me about the uh, <laughs> eyes latte. But um, <laughs> I was just giving you Morgan, shit. Though. Morgan is quite particular, um, definitely with his coffee. And also, when we do coffee orders, he'll be very much like yeah. onto it. Whereas I feel like if I gave you the wrong coffee, you would be. Fine with that. I guess we can we can we can diss Morgan because he's not here. I was say, he's yeah, not he here. Can't, he can't defend himself. He can't defend himself. He can't at all. defend himself. I think it comes from your personality. I think his particular personality is uh, directed into his coffee order as well. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. I feel like I feel like he's probably yeah the most particular. I mean, particularly he has a routine in the morning when he makes his coffee. Um, yeah. So. Whereas I think you and I just freaking. Just he's the most routine oriented. Yeah. Gotcha. Which okay. which goes into his we'll coffee order. We'll play that one. Yeah. Guess Corey. One more question. You talked about going to cities uh, in different countries, experiencing coffee shops wherever you're at. You're in Philly. Have you gone anywhere? Well, there was a coffee shop that we loved that I know Sage um, heard a click of loves. It's that Swedish place, but it's been knocked down. Oh. Can't remember what it's called. Though. Breaks my heart. I don't think I ever went to that one. It was a really good place. I can't remember the name. Um, I don't have my phone on me, but it was a Swedish uh, coffee place, and they'd have like one or two people there, and you'd have to wait in line, and you'd just eventually order. Where did we go this morning? I think it's called Vibrant. <laughs> Vibrant Coffee. It was quite good. It was they, quite good. They what's good what's the rating? There. The rating. Uh, it came in a takeaway cup. Yeah. Which... See, if it's a takeaway cup, it's always going to be down a couple I'll points. I'll say that points down. Yeah. yeah. Points down if it's a takeaway cup. If they don't know what a that flat white is, it's points down for me personally. <laughs> um, usually they just they'll type in cappuccino and it's the same, but it's different sizing. Uh, but if the if they got good latte art, it's a big point up. They um, asked if Joe was from Australia, though. Yeah, when, yeah. <laughs> when he because he ordered a flat white and maybe he'd seen you come in, so he was like, "Oh, there must well, be he, there he must and, be an Australian here." <laughs> he and Sage ordered first, which and was then a good I ordered the flat white, and then I think he went back in to get the second round. And he just, they asked him, "Oh, are you are you an Aussie?" And he said, "No, no, I'm with a Kiwi and an Aussie, though. That's why I'm drinking flat white." <laughs> that was so a we green, converted. That was a green flag. That was a green flag. Yeah. Awesome, Corey. Do you have any other questions? Does no. anyone else have any other? Does anybody from the? Oh, to your right, Corey. Um, so all three of you guys are NCAA champions, and now you're, like, still getting better. So how do you guys, like, keep progressing as you get older? And, like, what do you do to be better than you were yesterday? That's a good question. Good question. Yeah. Insta I was an NCAA champion a long freaking time ago. <laughs> uh, 2019, I think. And fortunately, I have uh, managed to keep progressing and, and get a little better each year since mm. then. I think the biggest thing is just uh, becoming really consistent with like a, a high level of training. I think I struggled with that in, in college through kind of some injury, but also I think, I think when you become a pro, you, you can prioritize your running a little more and you know, prioritize your routine more without having to do homework and <laughs> other random school related stuff. You did homework? Um, when I, on the, always the night before. I was definitely, I was, I was always the night before, a, guys. Well, I was always the uh, night before. Not great. Who's the most, who was the most studious, do you think, out of the three of us? Yeah, yeah. I feel like Morgan was quite studious, but you're pretty, you're an engineer. I was, I'm an econ major. It doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, but yeah, econ was the, uh, was this the general option? My, my, uh, theory was like, my challenge was to get as good a grades as possible with, as little effort as possible. <laughs> I think most student athletes do that. I go into right? an exam and like spend the first few minutes like reteaching myself how to do it instead mm -hmm. of studying the night before. That was my go-to. It's all about time management, you know? Time yeah, management. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's one thing that you can in always put on your resume if you're a student athlete in the NCAA is time management because you have to be forced to do time management otherwise mm -hmm. you will sink. Well, we've gotten distracted from the question. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I, I also remember that uh, your NCAA championship well. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. That long-haired Kiwi just going on the outside. Um, you know. uh, yeah, uh, being really consistent yeah. in um, just over, over a number of years. It takes like... It just takes years of, of doing the same thing over and over to, to really reap the benefits. Um, just years of years of running and, and years of workouts and just becoming just a stronger athlete takes takes a long time. Like I, I felt like I had kind of got to a, I'd kind of jump, made a little jump after college and, and then felt like I was kind of stuck in like 
almost like a bit of a plateau for a couple of years where I felt like I felt like kind of almost every race was going to be like some kind of breakthrough, but it never was for a long time. And you just have to kind of trust the as a lot as, trust as, the as, process. as cliche as it sounds like you just have to keep going and, and trust the process. And at some point, you know, and then it, and then it really did like, I just, you know, the jump, the jump came a couple of years later. And, and then I realized that I was at the level that, you know, I thought I was going to be those couple of years where I, where I wasn't. And I look back, I'm like, oh, actually, you know, I am running now at the level that, you know, I thought I was capable of. Definitely the way you've been training for sure. I mean, I think taking accountability too, I think that's a big thing. Um, once you, the NCAA system is amazing in the fact that you have a great coach, you have a great system. It's all structured out for you, you have treatment, all that sort of stuff. Um, but when you go professional athlete, you've got to take a lot more accountability. And I think the type of athletes that we have at the OAC, um, obviously we have an amazing coach and amazing support behind us with, with On. But um, to take accountability and to adapt and learn as an athlete like George, Definitely for the for, for the years that leading into to where he is now, you've you've taken accountability with your training, uh, with the way you live, the way you recover. Um, it's extremely important. That's how you progress. And there is really no magic formula other than consistency and, and good training and recovery. Like that's just the main thing about it. But if you do take fully control of it, particularly as a professional athlete, you have more time. There's no there's no homework holding you back from that. I think it really does it does help um, that fact to progress. And I think particularly with just having that kind of environment of people that we have, it, it breeds success. There's that old saying that um, a high tide raises all boats, and that's definitely the case with, with OAC and what we've been able to achieve in the, the few years that we've had. Yeah, absolutely. I think we just have the, the luxury of being able to surround ourselves with really like-minded athletes and, and individuals that, you know, set the bar so high that, you know, you almost have no choice but to, <laughs> but to set the bar. Yeah. Hi yourself. Yeah. Just got to raise, got to continue with the standards. Yeah, absolutely. Which is great. I love all that. Well, we're here at the Pen Relays Carnival presented by Toyota. This is one of my favorite meets of all time. I've been talking about that all week long. So I want to ask you guys, is there a certain event that you guys are looking forward to this weekend? Besides ones that besides you're, our own event. besides <laughs> the ones that you're competing in. I mean, I always love the DMR four by mile. Okay. But like, I think the college relays. Yeah, yeah. It, we're, yeah. We're obviously distance, middle distance based, but like watching any relay and having the crowd's response, particularly like notorious Jamaican fan supporters are just going crazy for every event. Like that's what you love about pen relays is just the engagement of the fans, of the crowd, of getting people excited about track and field, particularly with a relay event. It's a very um, unique um, competition, the pen relays. And uh any any relay you get to stand up and watch it's always exciting there's always something going on but for for me personally yeah the, the dmr four by mile yeah. is, is definitely even the college highlight. four by eight is great as yeah, well four by eight yeah i don't know any teams here but <laughs> i've assumed this they're going to be entertaining <laughs> mm -hmm. how about the masters races masters hundreds they went off yesterday and they look pretty solid how fast did they run well, Someone Mike ran 1332. What? Yes. That's pretty damn 72 good. 72 years old. Oh yeah, I'll be goodness. lucky to be able to walk by that age. <laughs> 13 seconds? Yes. Like, oh, my goodness. So maybe that's a follow-up. Do you... Are you going to compete in Masters one day? Could you see y'all doing that? No, I think my body will need a break at that point. <laughs> I'll be floating in the ocean somewhere. Um, that's probably what I'll be doing. I don't think I, I could put myself, my body through that. I don't think. What about you, George? I think no, I, there's no way I would... I feel like... I would just be feeling so bad by then. <laughs> that there's Not no even way. Not even a hundred though. I think that'd be worse. I though. think that is really? worse because you have to try really hard. You have yeah. to kind of like the the just the speed of it. You just you'd pull. I'd pull. A I'd put a hammy instantly. I Whereas like, like if it's like a, if it's like a longer <laughs> yeah. rent, you can slowly just jog That's into true. it. But if I'm trying to run a 13 seconds in a masters, I'm I'm scared that my Achilles or my <laughs> hamstring are just going to come off the bone probably. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe you'll see George I and Morgan in a four by one <laughs> relay. At, Pen relays with uh, I mean, we need a fourth member. I guess Tom Wayne can step up. 50, <laughs> 50 years from now. Fifty years. I from hope now. not. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ashley. Before we let the gentleman go, let's talk really quickly about our favorite race that went off yesterday. Well, I know there was a lot that happened. I think for me, it was the the collegiate men's five k because I think we had a really inspiring story. You know, you had Will Coogan, Patrick Anderson of UNC. Um, you know, they they Will Coogan won that race all, about a year ago. They were almost in a near fatal car accident. Mm -hmm. And I believe this was their third race back since they were in that accident. And I mean, that's just, that's just so inspiring, you know, to like see, you know, the bounce back, you know, you face 
such a terrible, you know, adversity like that, but you bounce back. And I think that's just a testament to the system that UNC has over there. And, um, you know, for me, that was a really big highlight. Yeah, I think for me, it was NC State's Leah Stevens and Kelsey Camille going one, two in the women's tag. Hey, you and I were on the track there watching such a great moment of just teamwork, um, just progressing there as they went 3309, 25 and 33, 1566. I know that's just been the huge talk of the town going into Penn Relays. Um, so gentlemen, we want to thank you guys so much for joining us. But before we let you go, there's something special happening between 1230 and 1.30 today. What should we know about that time frame? George Beamish is going to be giving out free coffees. No, um, <laughs> we, we, uh, we have an autograph signing, don't we, George? I think it's a little more than that. Well, I think we're right over here next yeah. to his table. So but you guys can go right over there. I think there's going to be some giveaways, too. Oh, yeah. We do have some... We have some goodie bags. We have some first in first serve T-shirts. Coffee, yeah. Special edition Coffee Club oh, T-shirts. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Is that the 1230 thing? Well, <laughs> is that the on thing or the Coffee Club thing? Because we're kind of big now, so we've got our own little... <laughs> I'm like, where can up. I get that shirt from? Yeah, you can get it on our website. Okay. Um, you can, there's also the shirts with our heads on it if you're really oh. feeling ad adventurous. I but, that's uh, what I shirts everyone needs. Yeah. But, that's um, what we need. No, no, we've got some special coffee club stuff coming up and some special OAC stuff. And I think the OAC stuff's first. We're going for a world best. We're going for was, Gus's world ask. best, yeah. Um, NIL deal signings. Um, we're really trying to get as many NILs out there as we yeah, can. Yeah, can we talk about that? Are we going for a world record attempt here? We are. Yes, we are. So okay, world record attempt. Gosh. So we need everybody's help with that. We do. We need people out to fill out the little uh, NIL forms, and they'll get a little goodie bag and, and uh, signing with, uh, with Coffee Club, and we'll be able to post that out and hopefully collaborate with you guys on social media. That awesome. is after the... Uh, after just confirmed. I've just had a little inside information. I didn't get that. <laughs> I didn't get that. <laughs> I didn't get that. That, that is after the autograph. Yeah. OAC autograph signing first. Co NIL. Coffee Club NIL World second. Best. Mm -hmm. Right uh, after that. Okay, I think we have one more question over here. Is there an age limit to your NILs? <laughs> no, there is not an age limit to our nope. NILs. Okay. There is not an age limit at all. Not yeah. at all. <laughs> so, awesome. All welcome. Good to know. Okay, yeah. so everybody, if you heard all of that, 12.30 to 1.30 to our right, so everybody's left. Far side, you can meet the crew. Yeah, we'll be here for a couple hours. Yeah, we'll be hanging out. Say yeah. hello. Awesome. That'll be awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you guys so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for having, having us. us. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Flow Track Podcast presented by Wonderful Pistachios here at the On Athletics Hub for the Penn Relays Carnival presented by Toyota. Again, we have two amazing special guests joining us today. Help me to welcome Yard Nagoose and Sage Herta Klecker to the show. Yes? yes. Round of applause, <laughs> yes. rightfully so. We have the American record holder in the mile, the indoor record holder in the 3K, US champion in the 1500. Yard took silver at indoors in the 3K, and then Sage, two-time NCAA indoor champion from Colorado, an OAC athlete who finished fourth in the 800 meters at the USA's last year, and a New Yorker at heart who ran at Penn Relays when she was a high schooler. Mm -hmm. So welcome. We are super excited to have y'all here. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right, Yard, I'm going to start with you first. We are here at Penn. You just talked about how last year was rainy. You're like, oh, I'm not quite sure if I want to come back, but we have beautiful sunshine here. So the last time you were here was 2019 when you were at Notre Dame. Yes. How are you feeling about being back? It's, it's, I think it was, it's good to be back because I always enjoyed the energy at Penn. It was more just like my actual races. I was just like, man, I can just never get Penn right. And I always wanted a Penn wheel. I never got one, which is kind of sad, but still, great to be back and just racing it again. <laughs> and then Sage, you came back in 2022 when you won the 800 meters. What was about that feeling that you liked? Let's start there. The feeling of yes. winning the 800 in 2022, that was really special because here was the first time I ran under two minutes. So um, I really have some magic here and mm -hmm. I hope to recreate that tomorrow a little bit. Was that your first time competing here since high school? Yeah. Yeah. I never came in college. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was a special moment then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've seen the race videos of you competing in, in high school. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the That's difference then between like high school and then competing as a pro? Um, in high school, this was definitely like a big meet, especially early in the season yeah. uh, for the, for New York state. And so it was always a big opportunity to challenge myself and run against people who I wouldn't normally run against. Mm -hmm. um, just all across the Northeast. And then as a pro, it was, it was a little different. Um, you're not I, also very early season, but just a little bit more of like a stepping stone to right. what's go, mm -hmm. uh, going to happen in the later months. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Sage, you're set for the Olympic Development 1500 mm -hmm. this Saturday at 2 p.m., not the 800. What are your goals for Saturday? Obviously, you mentioned that, like, you know, this is, well, obviously, it's a huge year at the Olympics, yeah. you know, right around the corner, it's creeping up on us. But, like, what are your goals with this Penn Relays 1500 this weekend? Yeah, so this will be my one fifteen hundred that I get to run at this <laughs> beginning part of the season. So, I don't know, just hopefully, uh, I'd love to run fast, but more importantly, go out there, compete, and, you know, close hard. Sage, you were... I'll go back to you about that. We're, you were fourth at USA's in the 800 last year. Season best, 158.09. You know, you're, you're back at it. I mentioned already that, you know, the Olympics are on the corner. You're back at it with a chance to make a team. How have you approached your mindset, especially in that 800? Again, it's still early, but, like, is there is there, like, a mindset change a little bit since we're, you know, as we're getting closer to the trials and such? Yeah, I think the biggest mindset change is that fall-winter training into this, like, spring season where at first I need to recuperate from last year and then, it can feel really far away, like this actual training, but now we're sort of in that point where we're going to switch to like, okay, we're, we're relearning how to really hurt and relearning how to push hard. All right. So I know, Sage, you're going to be taking the track at two. Ten minutes later, we're going to see Yarid yep. in the Olympic development. Uh, well, first of all, you came here five years ago, but you're going to be in the Olympic development race in the mile at 210. So right after Sage be cheering her on, then you're going to hit the track. So how are you feeling just going into it at this point in the season? I'm feeling really good about it. I feel like um, races this early in the season are really nice because you don't have to, like, kind of stress too much about them. But, like, mm -hmm. it's still a great time to just, like, go out, have fun, and just kind of see where your training's at in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll just be a good gauge of where we're at and just, you know, going out there and having fun. I love the mile a lot more than I like the 1500, honestly. So it's a small difference, but it's an important one. <laughs> <laughs> how much of a difference? It's like, it's honestly just a big attitude shift. Like at least okay. like, I don't know. I just feel like 30% better. I'll put a number to it. 30%. 30%. That's such an yeah. accurate <laughs> percentage. You just like right off the bat. I just feel like something about the mile it feels like, feels more American. It just like, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like, <laughs> I don't like starting on the straight also. No. Like I think starting on the straight, just like there's too much time for things to happen. Where it's like the curve is just like immediately crash in so yeah, yeah. as know. an 800 runner i like the 1500 better because it's <laughs> really? that much shorter really yeah okay. <laughs> I, I see that okay yeah he's it's like oh it's not a full mile it's yeah. a little bit less yeah okay that's fair i see that i see that argument mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so yard for you like how are you just feeling mentally and what are those next steps that you're looking to take as we look for the next three months ahead yeah yeah i've been feeling really good just like right after coming off of a world indoors and doing yeah. really well there um, I've just felt like, you know, I'm at a really good point in my training and just like a really good point in my season in general, just be getting a lot of hard work in. And I think, um, you know, from here into now, it's like the Olympic trials, is obviously the biggest, um, first biggest peak. And then we're going to hopefully get to the Olympics and do something big there. Yeah. But, um, a lot of it is just, you know, keeping that consistency that I feel now throughout the whole year. Um, like I feel great now, but if I don't feel great, like come the Olympic trials, then like, what's the point? So just keeping watch of the little things and making sure that my season is long and fruitful. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yard, I feel like pretty obviously you've had a lot of big moments, I think, within the past year. And I want to mm -hmm. take you back to one moment I really remember because I know we were both there in person to watch this. I want to yes. talk to him a minute about the Prefontaine Classic. Yeah. <laughs> that, that mile race there with Jakob, American record, breaking that record that was held by Alan Webb. Like, mm -hmm. I remember watching that race and I was like, oh my gosh, like just especially down at the end, you know, it was so close there at the, at the finish. Like, can you talk a little bit about that race? Like, I've always wanted to know like what, you know, was going through your head in that moment. And then afterwards when you broke that record, like what was that feeling like? Yeah, I mean, like coming into that race, a lot of it was just like, it's the last race of the season. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to go out and run as fast as I can and then see what happens. Um, so I didn't want to like be worried about just anything else in the race. I was just like, I'm just going to go for that American record and then see what I can do. And I think, like, it didn't really hit me how, like, fast we were going to, like, I think, like, three laps in we hit that bell lap. I was like, wow, we are, like, still going very fast. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, like, at that moment, you know, one lap to go, you're kind of, like, locked in anyway. You're just, whatever, not really thinking too much anyway. But, um, you know, in my head, it was just, like, just beat Jakob. Like, you can do that. Like, beat Jakob, get the American record, and it'll be great. But, you know, even though I didn't beat Jakob, I was still really happy to come away with one really fun race and just also just uh, the American record. So. Mm -hmm. All right, I know we just talked a lot of track. Let's shift the gear maybe to some fun questions. Does that work for y'all? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Sage, you're, you're right off the bat here. The first post, okay, so we did a little deep dive, you know, some social media deep diving. Mm -hmm. yeah, we that's... noticed the first post you ever made on your Instagram was a POV, POV of a cat. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about that? Like, the cat has your, would you say that your social media game has evolved since then? You know, I think it was a different era. It was probably, <laughs> probably like 2013, 2014. Um, those are probably one of my two cats back at home. Well, uh, Firebolt and Snitch, Harry Potter reference. Oh, I like that. I like love that. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I love those little guys. <laughs> Speaking of pets. <laughs> so, I feel like we have to. We have to. I feel like the whole world at this point knows about your pet turtle, Tyro. Correct? Tyro, yes. Tortoise. It's important. Tortoise. Okay, that's the, the big difference. How often do you get that question first off about your your tortoise? It's it's felt like it happened a lot more right after I got like the American record. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that <laughs> specifically like launched it into it, but like. And like especially like while he was hibernating, everyone's like, "How's Tyro? He's sleeping." <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna bring that up because I, I remember we were at Milrose Games, yes. and I, I think I asked you. I was like, "Yeah, so how's how's the tortoise?" And yes. you said he's hiber he's hibernating. Yes. How's the tortoise now? How's Tyro right now? So he's woken up. Okay, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> he's woken up. He's healthy now, and just like kind of really getting back into the swing of things. He's been actually like way more active than he has been in the past. So I think he was just very excited to get up, get going, and so he's just always, you can always hear him like scratching around, like just running around his little um, <laughs> enclosure, I guess, <laughs> but you know, he's really cute and good to have back. Yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing your art at Milrose too, and I was like, I know Ashley probably asked you this, but I have to know about Tyro, how yeah. he's doing, <laughs> so hibernating, so now we know he's up, moving around, he's yeah. good to go. <laughs> Everyone should know that now, which is awesome. <laughs> All right, Yard, I want to talk about the bowling team. In high oh school. <laughs> <laughs> the bowling team. So how was that experience, and what was your top score? Okay, so the bowling team was fun in the moment. I only, in the moment. I only joined it because <laughs> I think I didn't know a lot of sports, and I wasn't a big sporty person, so I was like, this will be great for college apps. I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but I thought bowling would put me a step above everyone else. Um, <laughs> And so, like, I learned, like, actually, they taught me a lot of bowling techniques because, like, I just joined. And it was just kind of annoying because, like, you had to get your own ride to, like, the bowling alley. And then, like, you know, your parents come pick you up. My parents were just like, we don't want to come pick you up after school. We're busy. We got, like, five other kids. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, like, I learned a lot of good stuff, and it was fun. I think my highest was, like, uh, 180s. Okay. But I never got near that again after I quit. So, so I, do you I, bowl I, now yeah. still? Like That's occasionally? No. If I bowl now, I like throw my back out and I just <laughs> like. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> don't give me that. I can't risk <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> now, Sage, two cats. You have a dog too, as well, correct? Uh, yeah, I have two dogs. Two dogs. Okay. So, Minnie is one of them. Is that correct? And yeah. what's, what's your other dog's name? Tucker. Tucker. Tell that. me about Minnie and Tucker. Yeah, so uh, Tucker's our, our little guy. We had him. Uh, he was a he was a COVID lockdown puppy. So it was like I see. everything <laughs> shut down. I was like, okay, we got to get a dog. <laughs> you know, we have, we have nothing else to do. And then Minnie's kind of like my right-hand girl. She's, uh, I was, at first I was like kind of hesitant about getting a second dog. But, of course, then it turns out that like now she's like my best friend and you know she she loves to sleep like literally right on top of me every single night oh that's are cute. you more of a cat person or a dog person um historically a cat person okay. but my husband joe he's allergic to cats oh. so you know <laughs> there we go it's that's uh, tough. it's a shame yeah yes. <laughs> uh, i do love dogs too so it, it works out and tucker's so small he's like kind of like a cat i saw a post you made on instagram too i think it was Minnie wearing, was it solar eclipse glasses? Yeah, yeah. That was cute. Did, so did y'all have the, the solar eclipse recently experienced together with the pets? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, it was only like 60% where we are. But it's still kind of cool to see the, the moon going in front of the sun. I don't think she, first of all, she didn't really like it. She she only really kept them on for long enough to get the photo. <laughs> yes. Because she's like, why can I not see anything anymore? Uh, yeah, so I don't think she fully appreciated the eclipse. I was going to say, Tyro hated it. Like, I brought it. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Cause, like it got like kind of colder when it happened, like yeah. not like yeah. super noticeably, but like just coldly enough. I did notice to that. where like mm -hmm. he was just like, mm, and he was just like trying to get back because I, I brought him outside and he was just like desperately trying to get back in, and I'm just like, okay, I'm sorry, like. Because <laughs> well, we were we, we were, were, in, were Austin. in Austin and we were in almost like almost the path of totality, and it, it got so dark and it, it was so. Cold, and yeah. it was cloudy too, so that didn't help much. But no. all of a sudden, it just got really dark. And you just, if you listen to the commentary of the videos that are of us at um, the off at the office, it's like all you hear is me saying, "Oh, it's getting really dark." Oh, it's <laughs> really, really dark. <laughs> all right, so we talked about pets. Yes, I think now let's let's shift the music. We're gonna touch all different yes. things. Liv, you asked Yard this question. I, I love. Think. I, yes, I did ask Yard this question. Do you need to ask this question then, not me? 
Taylor Swift. Let's start Taylor there. Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift. Okay, Yarin, are you you're still a fan? I am, yeah. Okay. Sage, are you a Swifty? Yeah, no, not really. Not no, really. Okay, 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 that's okay. Mm -hmm. Have either one of you, I feel like I know the answer to this one. <laughs> have you listened to the new album? Yeah, I have. You, you have? Five. Sage? I, have, I have not. <laughs> you have not, okay. <laughs> so Yarin, do you have a favorite song already? From I, the album. I do. Um, Who's Afraid of Little Old Me is probably my favorite. Okay. It's very like I don't know. I just really like how that song goes and how it feels. Because you're like, who's afraid of little old me? And it's like, you should be. <laughs> 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 okay. Do you think Taylor is a miler by chance? I think I heard oh, like she was oh, running better. on a treadmill and singing. <laughs> to oh. prepare for her, her tour, tour, she did yes. a lot of running on the treadmill, I So believe. do we think she's I, a miler? I, this. I don't know. I feel like... I don't know. She, she's giving more like 5K energy. Yeah. 5K energy? <laughs> okay. okay. If I had to guess, I don't know. Myler's like a certain breed, yeah. I feel like. What is, wait, what's that breed then? Um, I don't know. I guess me. <laughs> <laughs> the yarn energy. I love that. I like that. I love that. I feel like now we got to keep going with... I feel like we, 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 when we were doing the research for these questions, we found just so many anecdotes. We did. <laughs> and it's hard to touch on all of them, but... Let's go ahead with another one. How about that? Yarid, I want to take it back to, this is a question for you, and then Sage, I'll have a similar question for you a little bit. Let's take it back to NCAA Outdoors 2019. I read a story that uh, the race was in Austin, Texas, I believe, and yeah. which we're from Austin. We know yeah. how hot it gets there. You wanted to escape the heat, so you found a car with AC and fell asleep. Matt Sparks, your coach, had to wake you up so you could go make the final. Okay. Is that, is that true? Is that accurate? It's it's like ninety percent accurate. I <laughs> it was more like I was like kind of just sitting outside, and my coach Carlson, he was like, "You can't just be out here in the heat. You gotta be cold." So like he's like took me back to the car that we drove in, and then he just like turned on the AC and was just like, "All right, just sit here, wait till your race starts." And I was kind of tired, so I just fell asleep. <laughs> but like I think I remember waking up by myself, maybe. I don't know. Maybe someone did wake me up, but I definitely <laughs> fell asleep in that car, and it was very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Say, did you have a similar experience or anything wild like that? Um, well, when I was in Austin regionals my freshman year, mm -hmm. it was so hot and humid. I like I remember I was warming up. I was running the steeplechase, and I was warming up in this parking garage. And I was like, "What if I just didn't show up?" Because I was so. <laughs> I, what if I just pretended I got lost and I wouldn't have to race in this oppressive heat? <laughs> I mean, I will say that that heat is that really, heat is ridiculous. especially in June. You know, oh in Austin. Oh my goodness! Yeah. You're just as soon as you step outside, just you're just drenched in sweat already. It was like that last year at NCAA. Of oh, course. absolutely. All right, I think we might have a question from the crowd. Yes. Sage, this is kind of a serious one, but you've been in Europe the last two years competing, mm -hmm. um, and obviously it's it's strengthened you. What what have those experiences? taught you about racing and competing you know as you move forward this year yeah i think it's helped me a little bit in terms of like how learning how to race tactically in really deep fields which is especially important in those international competitions but also the u.s final because it's a similar level um diamond league versus u.s final um and then i don't know it's just also been really amazing to get to travel and experience so many things and have a lot to look forward to in the sport so yeah i i feel like that's really helped me to level up my competition. Okay, I have a question for you. For both of you, actually. Do you think you guys could appear on Jeopardy? And how do you think you would fare? I feel like Yard and I would do really well. Okay. Yeah, okay. I feel yeah. like we kind of bring the nerdy energy to the team a little bit. <laughs> You, you have a lot more faith in me than I feel like you should. <laughs> <laughs> something about Jeopardy, like, I am nerdy, but something about Jeopardy specifically, like, I watch that sometimes, and I'm like, what the heck? Like, what am I looking at? Yeah. <laughs> I feel oh. like I would do pretty poorly on Jeopardy. I, I, I don't think I would do very well. No. It's very high I'd, pressure also. Yes. Like, yeah. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'd thrive in that environment. No, neither would I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Do we have any questions from the crowd? Okay. We have someone over here. For Yard, um, I just saw uh, an interview of you talking about how you're kind of making a jump now to believing in yourself a bit more in competition and racing and understanding that you are as good as people say that you are. My question is how, like, what do you do to kind of boost your self-confidence rather than just try to listen to other people? What do you internally do to help you feel strong about your performances? Yeah, I was going to say a lot of it is kind of like more a self-mentality focus I've been doing, um, especially this off-season. I feel like it's like a good time to kind of like build up your mindset a little bit about just generally how you feel about yourself and how you feel about your races. 
Um, so a lot of it is just like kind of like good self talk. Like I'll get done a good workout, I'll just be like, "Man, I killed that. I'm so good." Like <laughs> just to myself, though. I'm not saying that to other people, but like you know, just things to kind of like bolster up your own confidence a little bit because you know I feel like that's really what matters when you're in the heat of the race. It's just like what you think that you can do versus like what everyone else thinks. Um, so yeah, it's just been a lot of things like that. Just little things like little mantras or just like things I just say to myself to kind of like bolster myself up now and then when I have a good race hopefully tomorrow I'll be like yeah it's awesome I knew I could do that so stuff like that <laughs> all right I think we have time for like one or two other questions okay right there in the back hey guys oh, okay. uh, big fans of yours um, so this is a question for both of you uh, what is your bread and butter sharpening like you're, you're getting down to the Olympics now a uh, couple of, a couple of weeks away from the Olympics what is your bread and butter sharpening workout? And for Sage and for Yarn. I love that question. Mm -hmm. The bread and question. butter workout. I was going to say, I, I've i had different bread and butter workouts in the past. Usually nowadays, I kind of just do whatever my coach, in this case, Nathan, tells me. Uh, but I feel like workouts that make me feel really good are kind of just like extended interval reps of like something short. So like a 400 or 600 and doing like a lot of them. I think like six or seven or more. Just to like kind of be like, yeah, like I can keep keep at this pace for like a long time, and I feel really good about it. I think it's like that's a really good workout for me. Yeah, and then also inspired by Dathan, but my my recent bread and butter workout for uh, sharpening up for an 800 in the thick of the season is just six by 200 at about 28. So, um, you know, sort of sort of simulating that first 200 200 jog in between, and like maybe if I need it, we'll take a little bit of extra rest in the middle. All right. We have time for one more question. Okay, right over there. Hello, I'm a big fan. Uh, Hi. Do you feel that track beef in like before the Olympics and everything is good for the sport or bad for the sport? I just want your opinion on that. Um, I think track beef is probably, if it's like in good fun, I think it's good for the sport because I think it makes things more interesting and people are more interested to watch it. Um, Versus, like, if everyone's all buddy-buddy and friends, and it's like, ah, you know, whatever. So I think it can be good, but, like, if people actually hate each other, that's probably bad. I don't know. Just me. Slightly. <laughs> <Slightly. laughs> He's the nice guy in the 1500. Yeah, it's true. I'm not the kind of guy to make any beef with anyone, but, um, you know, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Yard and Sage, thank you guys so much for joining us today for the Flow Track Podcast presented by Wonderful Pistachios. For everyone joining us today, we will be back here tomorrow again for the final day of this amazing event here at the On Athletics Hub. We'll be kicking things off at 1130 a.m. Eastern time. We're wishing you guys all the best, and we have a lot of athletes warming up here, so we're wishing all of you guys the best as you compete, and we'll see you again here tomorrow.